in a good chunk of Marxist circles, there's the problem that dialectics, yes, the capital D dialectics, is explained away as the thesis antithesis synthesis schema without a moment's notice, and just is in itself that schema, according to them. Yet, what is wrong with just explaining away like that? For it, for it encompasses the universality of dialectics is only a sensitivity of observation of the dialectics in motion. In that way, what there they are implying isn't the concreteness of dialectics, but the abstraction of such. This is the problem. To give a mere abstraction that comes about in sense certainty and never really ponder why it is in itself that way from their observations of such. Marxists, coming from the long lying tradition of dialecticians like Hegel, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and so on and so on, should already know that mere empiricism is never enough to explain an event, like battles in a war, or a phenomenon, like the falling rate of profit. Nor is it totally truthful in its presentation as is for itself. An event has both contingent factors playing out in the entirety of its existence, its preconception, and its post-mortem. Nonetheless, that these contingencies can be filled to the brim with agendas that serve one-sided interests and nonetheless change how the event is even how the event is even before recognizing the contingency at hand. To further on with this point and the sensitivity point, once thought begins its reasoning of such, it will find out that the sensitivity truth lacks any concreteness and is the poorest form of the truth in itself. Yes, one places a controlled fire under a pot of water and lets it burn for a while, and eventually the pot is full of heated water. Yet, did it merely came that because the fired fire existed as is? No, that would, that would be silly to claim, even from an empirist's point of view, that fire existing under cold water just equals heated water and nothing else played into it. Rather, if one remembers chemistry class, that fire has to survive by combustion. That is to say, that fire in and for itself goes, goes through interacting in the medium with itself and air to produce contradictions that partially resolves itself by becoming heat, which some warms up the passing air, which strengthens the fire itself, and already, if we're to just continue on, the triadic schema cannot explain this, and it barely gets to the point where cold water becomes heated water, very in this medium of air, that is between the fire and let us for now call it a stove pot. In fact, we would have to go back to Hegel and refer to a multi-chromatic dialectic, that is to say, that you can't really pinpoint a clear thesis antithesis, but yet both will struggle with each other and both will result in an offhaben, a supersession in English, of, of themselves that no longer is their past self, yet remain, retains everything from it to what it is now. Regardless, let us focus on heat, since we brought it up in the fire-water example. Heat is the force 
of the antithesis that is fire. Since fire itself cannot make water hot, but its products can, and heat, when in the contingency of this situation, has to trickle its way through a medium between it and cool cold water, for which some heat will be carried away by the air, and some of that heat will be exciting the atoms of the metal of that pot, which will allow more heat to trickle in, because those atoms are too excited to carry on any more heat inside of them. This can be explained as the contradiction of free heat and atoms, that of which the atoms' contingent existence negates the quality of freedom for the heat, which will be exemplified more so when heat comes to interact with water itself. For when the free heat passes through the excited atoms, the water will now take those free heat and combine it with its existing state to become as interactive as those excited metal atoms down below it. Yet, it's not the only thing that will be transforming itself, for some of that water will be transformed into steam and other to vapor, since not everything can just simply be one product. This, the steam and vapor, are the, ex the excrement to the water sublimation, that being of a heated and boiling water. Yet, there's only one more problem to this. He doesn't just mope about at the bottom of the water, only in the heated up areas. It has to distill itself to create a sense of equilibrium and to, an avo and to avoid an unbalanced body that can certainly destabilize the whole system when left alone. Thus, another dialectic is at work to cover the contradictions between heated water and unheated water, and to finally resolve itself as warmed or boiling water if the fire continues as is. Yet this dialectic, the duochromatic dialectic, is different from the rest, again to pick on Hegel, and it can be identified as is that there is no true synthesis being produced about, but rather the medium of the system allows the heat to transfer to the unbalanced qualitative sides of water until equilibrium is achieved. This dialectic is rather the most concrete one can look into when they see the heat transfer between two mediating objects in one system that is water. As aforementioned, that being that being that it contains heated and unheated water. This synthesis in this duochromatic dialectic is always being produced, yet never at rest until every input is shut off or the output is changed out of nowhere. Without going to even more concreteness, Already the bombardment of dialectics within dialectics prove the point that the fire-water triad in and for itself isn't as what sense certainty led us to believe it to be. But to then just call a multi-traumatic dialectic would be wrong as well. Hypocrisy can be launched against me. Why am bother to bring all this up then? if you were to just reaffirm what sense Sunni just told us in the first place. There's a clear reason for such. Universality. Sense Sunni is still a wrong position to view the word from, from both metaphysical and dialectical positions, and it just brings out the poorest form of the truth, as aforementioned. The truth of the firewater triad is that it doesn't exist in a vacuum 
and it must interact with the material world as is, and must interact with it while retaining its dialectics in motion, but yet always respecting the other dialectics that are happening around it. This universality comprises of stuff that is in the system and not in it. Fire and water versus air and escaping heat, respectively. The universality is at work here. As such, the universality of the fire water triad specifically contains water and fire as their contingent factors, yet it will swap out heated water with unheated water depending on the production and transfer of heat while in a medium of material conditions for this triad. This universality comes to be a particular of a universal of the inclusion of it and air as it pertains to the surroundings of the triad. Universality, if not clearly stated, contains everything that is and everything that is it is not. That is to say, it is a not all, as I referred to Lacan, of course. To just re-emphasize and to tell again the definition of a medium, and to continue on with the streak of just explaining things away, a mediation, a medium, are things that allows two things to interact with each other and allow each other to pass their forces to each other and to ultimately affect and change each other. To bring up examples of things that wouldn't seem to be a mediation or a medium would be one, intuitiveness, which is only hypocritical in itself because it has a medium to pass through the medium of all knowledges and experiences and wisdoms, albeit it is a very fast one because these are these ones are at the forefront, supposedly, of the mind. Thus why it feels intuitive, but yet it's just a rather quick and more knowable counterintuitiveness. Or to even go on on the topic of immediacy, which really is just a medium that is just really fast. That is to say, the that is to say, for example, a bullet colliding with a wall. It seems like the bullet just merely crumpled up and just flipped backwards, or it penetrated through the wall. But for brief moments of of its life, the wall and the bullet interacted with each other given equal and opposite forces to each other, but since the wall was more massive, it was able to maintain its form, yet it will get cracks, however fast they may be. And on the bullet's end, if it has enough force, it will make a dent, or even will penetrate through it. But yet, during that time of penetration, some of the bullet will crumble up towards the tip of the bullet, even when it's penetrating the wall. And if it can't penetrate the wall, it will simply just crumple up and flip backwards in an ideal situation. But yet, the forces have to pass through something. This medium between the bullet and the wall was the touch that they gave off each other. Just imagine pressing your finger on the mouse right now. Or imagine pressing your finger on a face. You do feel something. That is your nerve telling you that you're obviously pressing your finger on your forehead or somewhere else on your body. But yet, without this touch, you wouldn't know that the fast forces were interacting with each other. The force of the finger applying pressure on the part of your body and the part of your body just reacting against it as to not let the finger just slip in through the body and kill you instantly. Thusly, the true medium between the finger and wherever you're placing that on your body is the skin, for the skin allows the telegraphing of the forces to happen on, even if it is the forefront between these two forces. Now that I have cleared up to the best of my abilities 
any possible misinterpretations, let's move on to why the triad works in and for itself when science. It asked Wissenschaft in German, that one, is involved. Grasp the fact that these dialectics comes as particulars to this universality that is the triadic schema in the firewater triad, which in their own rights are universals in and for itself within their own systems. Yet nonetheless, that they make the triad more concrete and less abstract in and for itself and reveals the true character of the triad as a system of interconnecting parts of fire and water that eventually leads to the qualitative change of unheated water to heated water. Thus, we have, a, we have arrived at one conclusion, or as Aristotle would call it, a workup to a definition that cannot be ignored. The conclusion is the fact that the dialectic itself is comprised of many contingent factors, like the interaction and established mediums of its universalities with other universalities, while the particulars of such play off within the universal and play off with the particulars of other universalities, which in any case allows itself or others to become revealed as such for what they are and offhaven again supersede its past self in some way that it cannot ignore the incorporation of the new item. And if I may just be free, free to ease tensions a bit, your knowledge, regardless of your agreement with the post or not, has been sublated to something higher than what it was before. Your brgif notion of dialectics can no more be simply with an abstract triadic schema, but a concrete and systematic computation of all possible factors that can be symbolized, and I do admit this is used more in a Lacanian fashion, the word symbolized, symbolized within a universal triad with all particular dialectics at work to satisfy the universal while resolving their own contradictions as to resolve the ultimate contradiction that is within the universal dialectic. This is where, to go back to the beginning, lies the problem with the Fichtean triad. It never is concrete, but always abstract about explaining the mess of dialectics, especially Hegel's dialectics.